The night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. Did you mean the always frozen J.V. Johnson? Because I, I can't get warm tonight. What is going it's on? It's nasty cold. It, it is. It's just nasty out. You I know, I, I was outside earlier and it was like 13 degrees. Yeah, it's cold, and then the, that wind is just, uh, I don't know if you're getting the same wind we are getting here from the north, but man, that well, stuff we had, we had it yesterday, remember? Was it cold? <laughs> yeah, but was it cold like it, it is? It, well, it was, but it wasn't as cold as it, as it is now. Oh, it just but, bites. I mean, yeah, and we ended up losing all power. My whole area lost yeah. power. We got it back at like 4 a.m. yesterday. Yeah, I went to the post office earlier today, just took a walk like I normally do, and, you know, my face hurt, and, you know, my hands were like, numb. Well, your face has been it's killing me. me. For a yeah, long it's time. killing me. I knew that was coming. I mean, yeah, opportunity. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't, I know. I, I just, that was a little softball. Yeah, I tossed yeah. that <laughs> right in there for like, you. Like a, you set it up and spike. <laughs> Anyway, so um, in spite of the cold, we've got a really interesting show because we're going to be talking about not only something that's interesting, but we're going to be talking about Florida, which is a heck of a lot warmer than it is here. Yes, yes. We're going to be talking about the Coral Castle, Mm -hmm. which is an amazing place. I mean, just mind blowing how one person could have created all this and how did they do it? Yeah. Edward um, Leeds Galman is the gentleman. I believe he was Lithuanian or Latvian. He's from the Baltic States. I don't remember. And our guest, R.L. Poole, will will give us the history. But um, he built this thing under, uh, you know, the cloak of darkness and walls. And and he, he put into place 30 ton stones by himself or at least reportedly by himself. But our our author friend, R.L. Poole, has uh, what he believes to be the solution to these mysteries, how this 100-pound, very um, small, framed... Five-foot man. Yeah, framed man uh, could have built this uh, unbelievable megalithic structure by himself. By himself, He claims um, that this is actually the model for a lot of the great structures around the world, like the Great Pyramid, Pyramids and other uh, what seemingly impossible archaic structures that uh, you know were built over the course of history. Well... Ed had wrote back in his journal or whatever it was when he was building this place, I have discovered the secrets of the pyramid and have found out how the Egyptians and the ancient builders of Peru, the Yucatan, and Asia, with only primitive tools, raised and set in place blocks of stones weighing many tons. I mean, if, if, if this is something that is a lost uh, science... And we can rediscover this. I mean, it seems to have uh, far-reaching implications in uh, not just in construction methods, but in the ability to uh, defeat gravity and um, you know use it for other purposes. Well, besides that, I mean, if this was really how, you know, if he was able to do this, um, and that was how they were able to do the the great pyramids and things, they would be amazing. It's just, and to think that that technology would have been lost. In a day now where it's all about technology and we still don't have that information now, maybe it's just they're not investing enough effort into that area. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what the answer is here, but um, R.L. Poole is going to give us some insight into all of that. Um, tomorrow night, by the way, we've got uh, another author with us, Paul Selig. He'll be talking about the Book of Freedom, which is the third book in the Mastery Trilogy. This particular book shows readers how to find full expression as the divine self through surrender and acquiescence to the true nature of their being. That should be great. And then Thursday, we've got Joe McQuillan. He's an author, and we'll be discussing his story of searching for his son, Christopher, on the other side. So, of course, that's going to be a, a, a very tough and touching. An emotional one, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Touching show. So make sure you tune in. If you haven't yet, head over to Facebook.com slash Beyond Reality Radio. Like that Facebook page for us. Then head to BeyondRealityRadio.com. You can find all the stations we're on across the country, and the list is constantly being updated. You can also download the smartphone apps, which allow you to listen live, catch past shows, join the online chat, and more. And Or any night we're live, just feel free to click the Listen Live button and listen to the show while browsing the rest of the web or listening right there on the website. If you download the show uh, from iTunes or anywhere else, just take two seconds of your time and rate it for us. It helps push it forward makes it easier to find, and that really helps us out, and we greatly appreciate it. You've heard of CRISPR, right? You know that gene splicing technology? Yes. It's, yes. Um, there's a company that's actually named after that. I'm assuming it's the company that came up with the technique. Well, they've just started human trials uh, to try to cure some medical conditions using gene splicing. Um, they have done it with uh, lab animals, and they've just started to try to treat a rare blood disease uh, on humans. 
um, with this CRISPR technology. It is what is considered to be like home gene splicing. It is a technique in which you can buy a kit and actually uh, try this stuff yourself. I'm not sure that's a great idea or not. I, I don't know. Crapco should get on that. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely a Crapco product. Make your cat your dog. They, they, um, they talk about treating the first patient in this study as being a medical milestone and the beginning of uh, efforts to fully realize the promise of gene therapies um, in a new class of potentially transformative medicines that treat serious diseases. They're talking about in uh, a short period of time, they'll be able to treat things like sickle cell anemia and ultimately cancer. That would be amazing. Yeah, it really would. I love good news like that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm still waiting on that whole cure for cancer that was coming out of Israel, right? Yeah, they were. They said within a year they were going to have uh, something to be able to show us. Um, you know, but I always get a little. I mean, as much as I love hearing that news, it seems like I've heard stuff like that before, and it just never seems to materialize. Well, fingers crossed. I, hey, I'm hopeful. I mean, again, you know, you you and I both know what that disease can, as as almost everybody does, what that disease can do to families and people, and uh, you know, the sooner we come up with a way to defeat it, the better. Absolutely. All right, so let's take a break and let's get our guest on the line. You'll listen to Jason and JV, Beyond Reality Radio. We'll be back after this. Did you know that online retailers like Amazon have constant deals that can save you money on the things you buy every day? It's no joke. Save 40%, 50%, even 80% on great products. And all you have to do is know about them. Noodle Shark is the way to be alerted when something good is coming your way. Noodle Shark is the social media page that lists great deals that not only save you money, but give you the deals before anyone else has them. All all you have to do is find Noodle Shark on Facebook. Search it as The Noodle Shark. That's The Noodle Shark because you deserve to save too. Become a shark and save. You know, I'm really surprised you didn't say anything about my hair. I mean, I I, I got up <laughs> late from really my nothing you can say about that mop. <laughs> I got up late from my uh, pre-show rest. We'll call we'll call it that, but it's really a nap. And uh, I usually try to uh, take a quick shower just because my hair gets so crazy. I get nap hair. And um, you, know, you didn't say anything. I mean, it's sticking up and all, all over the place. I'm still an on how you can nap during the day. I wish I could. You know yeah. me for how long? Well, for, forever. And I've never been able to do it. Well, I, you know, when you only get a couple hours at night, you got to try to pick, make up somewhere. So I. You didn't say anything about my hair. <laughs> oh, your chest hair. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say which hair. <laughs> anyway, welcome back to the program. It's Beyond Reality Radio. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Coral Castle and more importantly, the architect and builder of Coral Cal- Castle, uh, Ed Leedskelman. Um, the, our guest tonight is uh, R.L. Poole. He's an author of a book called The Leedskelman Codex Breakthrough in Understanding Coral Cal- Castle. And we welcome R.L. to the program. R.L., it's great to have you here tonight. Thank you very much for having me, gentlemen. Oh, thanks for coming on. So let's, um, you know, start with uh, some definitions so that everybody understands what we're talking about, because I think most people know what Coral Castle is. But in case they don't, tell us exactly what we're talking about here. What is Coral Castle? First of all, that is a great question. I think it's great to establish a, a vocabulary for people um, who are new to the subject. Ed Leeds Gullman was a, a Latvian immigrant who came here uh, in the early 1900s. And he bought a plot of land in Florida. And within a year of acquiring the land, he had built the only modern megalithic structure ever. Um, and he did it with no machines, no power tools, the sketchiest equipment you can imagine. Um, and he claimed to know the secrets to the pyramids. Uh, he, he moved 1,100 tons of stone in his lifetime. Uh, he's moved the largest stone ever moved by a single person, and Ed Leeds Cullinan was five feet tall and weighed less than 100 pounds. Well, and when you say pretty much the equipment he was I know it was mainly like makeshift tripods and chains and things like that, correct? Yes, and, and here's uh, two kind of interesting things. Is one is they were all junk, junk parts out of scrapyards. And the second is, is that they were inadequate for the tasks that he was performing. So what you're saying then, by implication, is that there was something else afoot here. There was another force involved. And that's, I'm assuming, what we're going to get into as we continue this conversation. That is exactly correct, and I certainly hope that we do. But let's go back to... um, Ed, for a second here, he was a, you said, a Latvian immigrant. He came to the United States, bought a plot of land in Florida, and within a year he had uh, created this structure. Yeah, there was an announcement in the newspaper that an Edward Leedsgallen had 
acquired a piece of property in South Florida and that he had planned on building. And this announcement was in February of 1923. Well, by the end of 1923, it was built. And did he give a reason for building this structure? He did. And I find it very curious. I mean, he said that he was, he told people that he, he, would, he would give tours. By the way, when he built this uh, place, it was meant uh, on the surface to be uh, a, a landmark. It was, a, it was a tourist attraction. He wanted to show it to people. And he would tell people that he had built it for his sweet 16. And he said that a girl named Agnes Scuffs had uh, rebuffed his um, proposal. And he, brokenhearted, moved to America and built this as a tribute to his Sweet 16. How old was he when he came here? I don't know how old he was. I want to say it was around 27 years old. I want to say that's right, because I remember seeing a picture of him uh, when he immigrated. They, they took his photograph, and, and he looked amazingly like uh, Tesla, which is, which is weird uh, in the photograph. He had a mustache and a bowler hat and very dapper. Um, but he looked a lot like Tesla, I remember, and I believe that he was 27 years old at the time the photograph was taken. Did he come here alone? He did, yes. He had no help, no family, seemingly no money. <laughs> it was and when unbelievable. He, yeah, and when he undertook this project, um, you say he announced that he was going to do it. Um, he uh, erected some walls, if I understand correctly. He didn't want anybody to see him actually building it, right? That was a big thing with that Leeds Golden was privacy. In fact, the plot of land he, he bought was out in the middle of nowhere. It was orange groves and dirt roads and no modern lighting. People have asked me this a lot. They're like, well, how could nobody see him? It's right in the middle of everything. Well, when he built it, it was in the middle of nowhere, and then things have been <laughs> built around it since. Well, and also he, he, he this, built it at night, too, sorry. correct? Right. He worked at night, and he worked alone. And he had this apparently uncanny sense of knowing when other people were nearby. And, and when people would approach, he would simply stop, walk away from his work, and just very patiently wait for them to leave. And then he would resume what he was doing. And when he finally completed this less than a year later, um, did he open it for tours? Was that uh, kind of what he did from that point on, or was there something else to it? He gave tours. Of, of his coral castle to people for 10 cents, the, the high price of a dime, <laughs> he would show you the, the most wondrous and modern megalithic structure ever built by a man with no machinery whatsoever. And he also would write pamphlets and booklets, and he would sell these, and he would put little advertisements in the newspaper. And you could, he asked for a dollar bill, and he would send you back these, uh, these amazing booklets that I have copies of myself. And uh, he was very interested in science and physics and magnetism, and he, his observations were captured in, in uh, these booklets, and he would sell them if people wanted to read. And you, the way you described that, you said, the, um, I, I'm, I don't have it word for word, but something like the, uh, the most amazing um, modern megalithic structure uh, created by man with no machinery. Is that how he described it, or are those your words? It's my, these are my words and my descriptions. He would just say, come and have a different experience. Come and see something unique. Uh, he never really pushed the impossibility of it. And this is what amazes me about Ed Leeds Golan. You know, when you see a magician, they do something that's very normal and prosaic, but they do it in a way that, that is meant to fool you into thinking it's impossible. What Ed Leeds Golan did was the opposite. He did the impossible and then very modestly would try to fool you into thinking that it was prosaic and normal. As he was building this, um, did the locals uh, have any uh, in uh, input or were they commenting on it? Did they even notice or uh, did they just uh, not concern themselves with it and not worry about what Ed Leeds Cullen was up to? It's very funny you bring this up, because I've talked to a lot of people about this, and the stories that I have gotten was that when he first got there and started setting up and working, people said, oh, look at that crazy guy over there, and he's gonna, he said he's going to do this and do that. No, that crazy, that crazy Ed guy. And then later, they see rocks being moved, 
And they're like, hey, he's doing it. Oh, wow. And it became this big buzz of speculation, and it became kind of a game to try to get in there and try to spy on Ed and see what he was doing and why was he doing it. And he was actually very talked about, and people were interested in what he was doing. Once they stopped laughing and started noticing, they became very interested. So the secrecy really became, uh, well, just a mystery that everybody wanted to try to understand how it was happening. Oh, of course. You know, people love mysteries. That's why we're talking on Beyond Reality Radio right now. And what was the size of the property that he was building on? Ultimately, what's the footprint of Coral Castle? Well, let's say it's about 10 acres. Um, but he only built on like a, an acre of it uh, when you go there. And I actually just flew back in today from the Coral Castle, and uh, it sits on about uh, an acre of land. Now, where it sits and now is not the original it. site, right? It's been moved since um, it was originally built, right? That's right. It was moved about 10 miles south of its original location, which has been kept off of the radar for quite a while. And the story behind why he moved it, 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 the folklore, is that he was bullied by some ruffians who were trying to get the secret out of him, and and he felt intimidated, and so he picked up and moved it uh, down the road. I have a completely different theory as to why that happened, and and it has nothing to do with with, uh, Ed being bullied. I think that... um, the Coral Castle, I just want to establish right off the bat that the Coral Castle, in my opinion, was not Ed's greatest accomplishment. It was the proof of it. I believe that the scientific concepts that he discovered that enabled him to be able to build the Coral Castle was his greatest achievement. And the Coral Castle was the proof of concept. For any scientific principle to be valid, you have to have verifiable and repeatable results. It's not good enough to be able to do a miracle one time. You have to repeat that in order for it to be valid. And I believe that was the reason he picked up and moved the entire castle 10 miles down the road was to show he couldn't just do it once, but he could do it again and again and again. So this was an amazing feat to begin with. And what you're telling us is he built this thing twice. Yes. (laughs) In fact, he even quarried stone out of both sites. He did it the same way. He picked it up and moved it. And they said that um, when he moved it uh, from its original site to where it is now in Homestead, Florida, that he hired a truck. It took two weeks. And and the gentleman who drove the truck, he would tell him, okay, I'm going to go ahead and load the truck. What I'd like you to do is is go take a break for a couple of hours and come back, and I'll have the truck loaded. And the truck driver looked at him naturally like he was crazy. He sees this little five foot tall, 100 pound man says, Hey, I'll I'll load all this, you know, these megalithic stones, multi-ton stones on the truck by myself. Don't need any help. And just come back in a couple of hours. I mean, that's, that's crazy. But I guess the, according to the story, he would come back and the truck's fully loaded and Ed's sitting in the truck ready to go. (laughs) And this repeated over and over for two weeks. He would drive it down. He'd say, okay, go take a break. When he come back, Ed would have the stones unloaded. And this went on for two weeks until he had the entire castle moved. And there wasn't anybody who ever was able to catch uh, catch what was really happening. One story that I heard, and I, and I do believe this, it's folklore, and I don't pay much attention to folklore. I find it to be misleading most of the time. But this one story, that there was a group of children who were somehow able to get close enough to see him, said that he had his hands on a stone, and the, he sounded like he was humming or singing in some way, but that he had his hands on the stone, and the stone appeared to be floating. Really? And that they said he was holding something, and this is the weird part to me, was that he was holding something that, sat, that looked like an ice cream cone or, or a microphone, some device that he had. And that he appeared, it it sounded like he was humming or singing, had his hands on the stone, and the stone appeared to be rising off the ground. Now, that doesn't sound like a child's story to me. That sounds too legitimate to be made up. So is it your contention that that story is a legitimate story? Because you had mentioned, uh, you know, folklore, whatever, um, child story. But you're saying that you believe there was something to that? I think that there is a kernel, at least a kernel of truth. In, in this particular piece of folklore. Hmm. 
Well, and there, there is a kernel of truth in almost all of it, but it's yeah. discerning which one, right. you know, and what it is. Well, and it's not too far fetched if you think about it, because there's different proofs that out there that that show is certain infrasounds and and so forth can move some, uh, can move objects. Um, but also, I know Ed Ed had claimed that if you reverse magnetic forces, the objects become much lighter. Correct? Yes, that's exactly right. And and what you're talking about is the effect called paramagnetism. And we don't have to prove this effect. It exists. Look at clouds. When you see clouds floating above our head, you see clouds that are flat on the bottom. They are being pushed up and pulled down simultaneously by magnetic forces. And, and the clouds being pressed against that magnetic field make them flat on the bottom, yet they float above our heads. And it's the same principle, but do that with stone instead of water vapor. And we're going to get into a lot of uh, that, the scientific component to all this, and your research and your work and the things that you've discovered. But first, at what point did this whole uh, project and idea and this gentleman and his work become of interest to you? When did it come onto your radar? Uh, A long time ago. I was nine, (laughs) and I was watching... Uh, one of my favorite shows of all time, even to this day, was in search of, oh, Leonard Nimoy, that droning narration. And I don't know what it was about it, but he absolutely captured my attention. RL, I've got to interrupt, I've got to interrupt you there because Jason and I have talked about that program so many times in this on this show. Um, it was served as an inspiration for both of us, and it has served in, uh, as an inspiration for the whole generation of people that come onto this program to talk about topics like this. So you're not alone. Oh, I certainly hope not, because it is a, that show is a national treasure. Uh, but the very first episode I ever saw was The Castle of Secrets, and it's still my favorite episode, of course. But I'm watching this, and I was a little sickly child, and and I was, you know, the smallest one in my class. And I'm watching this show about a little five foot tall man who weighs less than a hundred pounds, whose size is not a factor for him. He can do the impossible, and it didn't matter that he was small. And for some reason, I just I psychologically attached to that, and I really admired and and became fascinated with him. But, of course, years go by, and, you know, life life happens. And, and one day when I was, I don't know, in my early 30s, I was watching a show on Travel Channel or something, and they had mentioned the Coral Castle. And I said, you know, I wonder if anybody's ever figured that out. I did a whole bunch of research and found out empty pockets. Nobody's really gotten anywhere. And I felt like this was a great opportunity to to dig into this and to see If there were any answers, I could not imagine Ed Lee Skolden doing these amazing things and then leaving behind nothing. I just couldn't believe that. And for about four years, all I did was just carry around his booklets like a, like a, you know, Ed Lee Skolden fanboy and just read them and struggle to understand them and had no breakthroughs whatsoever. How long? One day. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. One day what? So one day. And it was about, I think it was in the year 2010. I'm sitting at home on Christmas vacation. And I'm watching the movie Iron Man. <laughs> and I'm watching Tony Stark in the cave. And he's trying to escape. And he's showing uh, the person he's in prison with, he ends in these drawings. It's just sketches uh, on different pieces of paper and separated. They make no sense. But he puts the pieces of paper together and he holds them up to the light and he shows them. And it shows the Mark I armor. And uh, I literally have the book sitting right next to me, uh, Magnetic Current and Animal, Vegetable, and Mineral Life. And one has a drawing of the perpetual motion holder, and the other one has these two weird little squiggles on it, and they don't make any sense. And people have flipped these around and tried to do all these things. But when I saw it, what Tony Stark did, and I looked at the booklets, and I looked at the screen in the books for about 10 minutes back and forth, and I picked it up, and I overlapped the covers, and I held it up to the light, and they locked like puzzle pieces. It was an amazing moment. It was like, it was the 4th of July in my brain. It was like, wow, oh my God, Ed hit this. He hit it. And even though he had no idea, he hit it for me because I was the one who found it. And that right there, that moment was when I knew 
that Ed Lee Scullin left the secrets behind. That was the moment. Tomorrow night, we've got a great program for you as well. We're going to be talking um, with another author. In fact, it'll be Paul Selig. He has got a book out called The Book of Freedom, the third book in the Mastery Trilogy. And this particular book shows readers how to find full expression as the divine self through surrender and acquiescence to the true nature of their being. That sounds pretty deep, Jay. That sounds very deep. It really does. And then Thursday, another author. Joe McQuillan, and we'll be discussing his story of searching for his son, Christopher, on the other side. So that, it's going to be a really touching story. Yeah, that's going to be heart-wrenching, I have a feeling. Um, and I hope, I'm hope i assuming it's going to be inspirational, too. So that's going to be a, a good discussion Thursday night. Tonight we're talking with R.L. Poole. He is the author of a book called The Lead Scoundrel Codex, Breakthroughs in Understanding Coral Castle. And uh, R.L., before we went to break, we were talking about um, you know uh, Ed Lead Scoundrel and, and um, you know his work, and we kind of cut you off. So I wanted you to pick it up right where you left off. Oh, you didn't cut me off. I thought it was a perfect cliffhanger. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, that works first. out good. Um, so when I, when I found that the covers, when you overlap them, they create a, a hidden diagram or what I call a secret schematic, that these two separate images lock together like puzzle pieces. He created something called the perpetual motion holder. And he said that magnetism was perpetual motion itself and that he created a device in which he would be able to hold magnetism perpetually. And it's true. I've built one his exact and ridiculous specifications. But um, what it does is that if you build it to his specifications, it's a U-shaped bar with a couple of coils and then a bar across the top. And if you zap the coils with direct current, that bar locks on to the prongs. And it will stay on there forever. It will stay like that in perpetuity. Well, it's a closed magnetic system. So that makes sense. But when you add the hidden part on the other cover, it now changes this from a magnetic device into an electrical device. And then you know it's true because when you read the first paragraph inside magnetic current, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, all of a sudden it becomes very plain. The paragraph says, this writing is lined up so when you read it, you face east. And everything you read about magnetic current, it will be just as good for your electricity. That's how he starts the book. Mm. <laughs> and, and I spent months of my life reading that, going, this makes no sense. I don't know what he means. Until when I found that, and I put it together, and I realized, oh, this is magnetic into electrical. This writing is lined up, so when you are reading it, you are facing east. Well, what happens when you're facing east? North is on your left, and south is on your right. He tells you the magnetic polarity of the perpetual motion holder. Then he says, everything you read about magnetic current will be just as good for your electricity. So if north is on the left, that's positive for electricity. If south is on the right, that is negative electrically. So he is giving you the code and the primer, but it only makes sense once you put the other pieces of the puzzle together. This is how Ed Lee Scullin works. So why didn't he try to pretty much dumb it down, or why why did he why code? Yeah. yeah, why code? Why did he not just come right out and tell people that you know, how how to do this? You mean like how I am? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, to be honest with you, you really haven't dumbed it down not enough for for some of us. But let's not. We're not getting into that. I just mean uh, with him, why why not come out and just say, "Look, I've I've figured this out. I, I I've been able to figure out how to do this." When you read some of Ed Leeds Collins' written works, you realize that he. Oh, I don't want to say anything that's bad about Ed, but Ed didn't like lazy people. Ed didn't like people who were easily fooled or believed what they were told or could not rationally perceive what was around them. He sort of set this up that if you could be fooled, then you deserve to be. If you can't find this, then you you can't have it. And it's almost like this intellectual gauntlet that he has set up that this marathon that if you make it to the end of this, that you earn the prize and the prize is the secret that he left behind. Well, but he also talks about how he, he 
was able to solve how the uh, the Egyptians did the pyramids and uh, th- things like that. But how this day and age where technology is is what everything is about, have we not been able to figure that out then? Well, it's because of the, the nature of assumption. We have we have technology, but we don't have restraint. We have data, but we don't have wisdom. There's a difference, and and what Ed had was wisdom. So more, and it's more, it's I just believe, knowledge of electronics and things of that. Not when it comes down to well, yeah, the, this whole other aspect of it, I guess. We have uh, in modern physics. According to Ed, it has been built on shifting sand. What, for instance, what Newton brilliantly observed as an apple falling to the earth and saying, there's a force being applied that is pulling that apple toward the center of the earth. He didn't know that at the core of our planet is a giant magnetic ball of iron and that we are awash in magnetism and we have a magnetosphere and a north and a south pole and that we generate electricity from spin, that we're a giant magnet. And Ed asserts this very clearly more than once in his written works. The earth is a great big magnet. Those are his exact words, and he's not wrong. But Newton did not know that, so he had to explain this force that he observed so brilliantly, but without the the benefit of this additional information, he had to invent a force, and that force was gravity. Years later, 400 years later, Einstein uh, took Newton's work and perpetuated gravity, and physics has been built on what is a a misnomer. It's magnetism is the governing force on this planet, not gravity. We, we have those. Hawking himself said that we do not know what gravity is or its principal role in the universe, but it has not stopped them from making it the foundational principle upon which all physics are based. That doesn't make any sense to me. We have uh, so much more to talk about as this con- conversation continues with R.L. Poole. He's the author of a book called The Lead Skeleton Codex, Breakthroughs and Understanding Coral Castle. And we're going to be taking your calls as well in the second hour of the program at 844-687-7669. And if you haven't yet, head over to facebook.com slash beyondrealityradio. Like that Facebook page for us. Then head to beyondrealityradio.com. You can find all the stations we air on across the country. That list is constantly being updated with new stations being added all the time. You can also download the free smartphone apps, which allow you to listen live, catch past shows, join the online chat, and more all on the go. Or any night we're live, just click the Listen Live button and listen while browsing the rest of the web right there from the website. All right, we're going to take a quick break. A lot more to come. You're listening to Jason and JV, Beyond Reality Radio. We'll be back after this. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Joha. That's J-O-H-A-W. The uh, entrepreneur, billionaire, uh, chairman of SpaceX. Of course, you know who I'm talking about, right? Elon Musk. Yeah. He uh, has decided that... uh, that it's important to send a backup of what they consider to be humanity. And I'm not talking biological backup. I'm talking about data backup. It's a 30 million page compendium of history's or humanity's greatest cultural offerings. It's on a special disc. It's meant to last a billion years. And he sent it to the moon to be uh, kept as a basically a backup in case of a catastrophe here on Earth. How do, how do we get it? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's the better question. Um, it's being uh, transported to the surface of the moon on an Israeli uh, spacecraft. It's being launched by the SpaceX Falcon, Falcon 9 heavy rocket. Um, but this library contains a vast archive of human history and civilization covering all subjects, cultures, nations, languages, genres, and time periods. Everything from the contents of Wikipedia to a compilation of human languages, the Rosetta Project, and books selected by Project Gutenberg, as well as uh, genome maps. So the human genome. Um, and Wait, six- The human genome? I mean, so what if something out there wasn't really... I mean, what if, what if something out there was totally open to the destruction of the human race? 
I mean, aren't you giving them everything giving they pretty the much secrets? need? Giving I, them the family yeah, secrets? I mean, well, let's break down their DNA. Let's do. Uh, here's the gene. Now we know what will kill them all. Yeah. Well, uh, it's all there for them now, uh, including books and music, and it's all encoded on a disc that's composed of twenty five nickel discs, each only 40 microns thick. It's a real uh, um, breakthrough technology as far as storage goes. However, um, you know, who knows if we'll ever need it or anyone will find it, but it'll be resting on the surface of the moon uh, for a billion years or so. Well, probably some of our history and some of our music and everything else should rest, be put to rest for a <laughs> should billion never, years. Should never be so. discovered again. I mean, um, yeah. One bit of history that is actually quite fascinating that we're learning about tonight is the history of Coral Castle built by Edward Leeds Kellen, um, and our our guest tonight is the author of a book, The Leeds Kellen Codex Breakthroughs in Understanding Coral Castle. We'll bring him back in a, in a minute. Uh, tomorrow night, we've got another author joining us. Paul Selig will be talking about his book called The Book of Freedom, which is the third book in the Mastery Trilogy. And it'll show readers how to find full expression as the divine self through surrender and acquiescence to the true nature of their being. And then Thursday, we've got Joe McQuillan on. He's an author, and we'll be discussing his story of searching for his son, Christopher, on the other side. So make sure you, you check those shows out. And every Friday, of course, is a best of Beyond Reality Radio. Uh, if you download sh- the show from iTunes or you subscribe at iTunes or anywhere else, just take two seconds of your time and please rate it for us. Helps uh, get it out there a little more, and uh, that's what it's all about. We R- greatly appreciate it. RL, uh, we're talking about Coral Castle and its architect and builder, Ed, uh, Edward Leeds Gullen. Um, let's talk a little bit about the theories prior to your discoveries of how this was built. Because there, I've heard everything from alien intervention to um, you know uh, use of magic. Uh, there are a lot of theories that have prevailed over the years. What are some of the more common theories that existed prior to your work? I'm happy to go into it. I'm sorry. I just have to share a thought with you about the Elon Musk thing. I just, I can hear him financing his next rocket by selling this DVD and <laughs> calling it. Now that's what I call humanity and, and order now. And yeah. I can just see it. But um, is it going to be on infomercials at like 1 a.m.? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that's what I call humanity. The, the theories are <laughs> okay. It was easy. This is what I hear all the time. Oh, it was easy. He, you know, he had tripods and chains, and ah, oh, you just got to hook it up a certain way, and you know, you, you just. But nobody's ever been able to do it. And you know, when you look at the equipment, they're like, "Well, we have pictures of it. We have pictures of of Ed using his tripod. We even have home movies of Ed lifting a stone using the chains and the hoist and the tripod. These are all whitewash." It's all an illusion. When you do the engineering math on this, and I have, now, the for, numbers are ridiculous. Hold on a second. Do, do we actually have film of him moving it? As, does that actually exist, but it's just it's just misinterpreted? Yes, it does exist. There is a video on YouTube that I have had to, to I mean, really have to shoot it down with a lot of hard work and some engineering math and some facts um, that... People said, well, look, see, he's lifting a stone. The stone he's shown, uh, there is a whole movie of it, and it's really cute. It said, showing how his tripod and, and the hoist and everything works, and he's lifting a stone that weighs about three tons. That's well within the rating, uh, the safety rating of the equipment that he's using. And the equipment that he's using are three pieces of Florida pine, a 10-ton chain hoist, and five-ton chain. And he's lifting a three-ton stone. But see, now this gets extrapolated to, oh, that's how he did it. One of the stones at the Coral Castle weighed 30 tons, 60,000 pounds. It is an impossible, impossible weight for a 100-pound man to move a 60,000-pound stone with the equipment that he is shown to use. So if, if he just wanted to lever that 60,000-pound stone out of the ground, here's what he would have to do. He'd have to have a lever 148 feet long. Oh, man. <laughs> On one end of the lever, the working end, he would have to have the weight equivalent of 11 full-size family vehicles, 22,222.22 pounds. But that's not enough because you're going to have to take that 22,000 pounds and you're going to have to hang it 38 feet, four stories in the air, because 
that's where the end of the working part of the lever will be once you get it under the stone to get it to achieve an equilibrium of 10 feet. And then once you do that, you have to find a lever that is 148 feet long that can withstand the weight of 82,000 pounds on a single point and still be made of a material that's light enough for poor little Ed to move around by himself. The numbers are just insane. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Well, no. He didn't use... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go right ahead. I was going to say, he, did, he didn't use magic, okay? He didn't use, he didn't use uh, the prosaic, hard method of, you know, because if he did, I, in all seriousness, that's a suicidal attempt to do something. And Ed was too smart and too clever. Somebody clever enough to build it would know that using these types of, of means were inadequate and dangerously inadequate to do it. Well, now let me ask you this, though. There's been talks for years and years about this mysterious black box that he tends to to have uh, during a lot of these a lot of these construction things and moving these these objects. And I think you're familiar with what I'm talking about, correct? Yeah. So, one of the benefits of of following Ed's instructions, uh, I built a perpetual motion holder, and, and the instructions are ridiculous. Take a one and a half inch thick steel bar, bend it in a U shape. Make sure the prongs are 12 inches long, no more than three inches apart. That's step one. Sure, Ed, and I'll be right back. But, but after doing this and building a complete, accurate uh, perpetual motion holder, and then I have a wireframe box that I made that I, that I kind of keep it in to make it easier to lug around and stuff. It's the same size as the black box that's on top of the tripod. And what I believe was in there was the perpetual motion holder and a Model T car battery. I believe when you add the missing part of the schematic and you turn it from a magnetic device into an electrical device, you can run AC current through the perpetual motion holder, in through the coils, and then out the three-inch coil that he has you build that goes across the bar. But somebody brought up this great point. They said, well, how do you stop the cogging effect? And this is when the bar jumps uh, off of the prongs from the the magnetism and the electricity reversing polarity. So it causes this jump and you can't keep a connection. And then I found it. Been doing it the whole time. When you put DC current on the coils, it locks the bar down. Yeah, and that's what he needed to do. He put DC current on the coils, lock the bar down, and then now he can run AC current. And you can see the cables coming down from the black box and wrapping around the stone itself. It has no other purpose. It's not supporting anything. It's not connected to anything. It just goes from the, from off to the side, up to the box, down from the box, and around the stone. And I believe that he was pumping these stones full of magnetic current. But it's not magic that he was using. He was using a, a, an understanding of magnetism. And, and based on celestial alignments, he was using this magnetism because if the Earth is a great big magnet, then... It stands to reason that you can extrapolate that over all celestial objects to some extent are great big magnets that are all rotating around each other in our solar system. Which leads me to the Sweet 16. Um, I, I have no problem believing that Ed loved a girl who broke his heart. It's happened to all of us. But the Sweet 16, I don't believe was her. Because on the east wall of the Coral Castle, what I discovered is it's not a bunch of random shapes. There are constellations along the wall that go from Virgo to Taurus, from left to right. You can use Google Sky Map and see it yourself. And what I figured out was it's not just constellations, but all around that wall, it adds up to 16 separate celestial alignments, all perfectly placed to be identified. And when you nail that down and you see it's a star map, it's not really that valuable except for marking time. It's a clock. So I had to go back and find a perfect 16-point match for a point in time for 16 different celestial alignments where they all match up with what Ed shows on the wall, and I found one, and it's perfect. It's September 10th, 1923, the year he built the castle. It was also the time of the autumnal equinox. It was the time of a total solar eclipse. 
It was the time of a four-point syzygy when the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, and Venus were all in perfectly straight alignment, and the celestial and ecliptic equators cross at exactly the middle point of this entire thing. It is bullseye. It is the 4th of July of celestial alignments. And it just so happened to be the year he built the castle. Again, you scratch your head. Why? Yeah. You know, why would it matter? But then I saw the way a trigger mechanism on a Gauss rifle works. It's a magnetic propellant. It uses no energy. It just uses magnetism. And if you look at the trigger mechanism, you see a ball bearing, a giant magnet, a ball bearing, and a ball bearing. It looks just like the celestial alignment of Venus, the sun, the moon, and the earth. And wouldn't you know it, on that day... Ed is exactly on the outside opposite of this entire push going in his direction. That just doesn't seem coincidental to me anymore. Let's um let's take a quick listener call before we go to break and we'll continue talking about all of this. This is Barry in North Carolina, a good friend of the program. Hey Barry, welcome to the show. Hey, what do you say, Jason and J V and R. L. Poole? My name is Barry Poole with an E on the yeah. end, just like yours. And um, oh, Barry. the reason, reason I'm calling, fellas, is that I used to live in Homestead, Florida, 30 years ago, 1988 and 89. And I've probably been to the Carl Castle 15 times. And uh, I remember the story and uh, talked with some people locally that uh, had relatives that knew Ed Leap's common. And the black box uh, they talked like was an anti-levitational device, anti-gravity, and uh, it moved. The, he actually moved the the Carl Castle from a little town called Florida City, Florida, to Homestead, mainly because the main highway that went from Miami, Florida, to Key Largo, and then on down a hundred more miles to Key West. He was he was after the tourist trade. That's the reason he moved it. Great oh, show, guys. Thanks, Barry. It's always good to hear from you, man. Well, I'm assuming since Barry lived there and he's been to the castle so many times, and he has the same last name as me, that he must, he must also be as devastatingly handsome as I am. And I'm going to take his word for part of that. But well, you Ed heard his voice, to of Homestead, course. Florida. If you count the letters of Homestead, Florida, it equals sixteen. Ed's obsessive number, 16. And to, I'm not saying that he's wrong, that he may have wanted to move it closer to the tourist trade, but I think it also stands to reason that if Ed was a scientist and this was the proof of his concept, that being able to repeat it and validate his scientific principles would also be part of that stock and trade. No, yeah, very possibly. Yeah. We're talking with R.L. Poole about his book, The Lead Scoundrel Codex Breakthroughs in Understanding Coral Castle. And I want to get back to uh, the point you were making before the break, um, R.L. You were talking about the celestial uh, map and the celestial information that is on one of the walls at Coral Castle. And you brought it all to a specific date. I think you said it was September 23rd. No, September 10th, uh, 1923. What's the significance of the date, other than the fact that that that's when the the celestial um, the celestial uh, occurrence or, or, or line uh, alignment occurred. You know what's so interesting about this, and for me, unique, is that it's several celestial events all coinciding at a single point in time. When you have what's called a syzygy, which is the alignment of three or more celestial objects in a straight line, and in this case, it's four, and then. It's the autumnal equinox, and this is when the Earth and the Sun, their equators line up. And then you have a total solar eclipse, and then you have the celestial and equator, uh, celestial and ecliptic equators crossing in the middle of that alignment. What I believe he is showing is that this is the secret. This is, this is the big secret. This is the secret that the Egyptians had, was that he was using the alignment of these celestial objects like the alignment of magnets and using this magnetic force to be able to push the stones away from the earth. Uh, this is, uh, I when mean, you look at a, the trigger mechanism of a Gauss rifle, 
That's it's, it's it, po- that's powerful. It, that's powerful stuff. It's, this isn't a, a powerful analysis, but did he have to have a, some kind of device to effectuate that, or does it happen naturally? Because I, think I know that, that it is something that you can only tell if you if you create a field which it, it allows it to be expressed. Be, okay, because <laughs> because these celestial bodies do line up over the course of time, and I've never uh, you know heard of a, a situation where um, suddenly I you know I or somebody or whatever has felt you know one fifth the weight that they normally do um, you know <laughs> when these bodies are lined up. So something has to effectuate it. Well, you, you have heard these effects. Maybe, maybe you didn't know. Ed built the Coral Castle on the corner of the Bermuda Triangle. Have you ever heard about anything weird happening in the Bermuda Triangle? Um, yeah, all the time. <laughs> I'd say, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, the Dragon's Triangle is on the same line of latitude on the other side of the planet. It's, it's the J- Japanese uh, Bermuda Triangle. They have ships that go in, they don't come out. They have planes that go in, but they don't come out. Um, the Great Pyramids of Giza are built on the same line of latitude, the zone of silence. I could, I could do this for days. What we see, and we're not, I think it's hard to put together, is that there are these magnetic anomalies that take place at different times on the same line of latitude on the planet, but we don't know what the causation is. And it's because the causation is millions of miles away and we can't see it. So it'll happen. This alignment occurs. Somebody's flying through the air with a, an electrical engine with a magneto in the motor that is spinning. And they get caught in this particular spot. And then something anomalous happens. And we go, well, we don't know. And, and I believe that the same phenomenon that was causing ships to sink and planes to disappear and, and, the zone of silence to be the anomalous area it was and the pyramids to be built and all these things that keep happening on the same line seem to be connected to magnetism and and possibly celestial alignments that we are unaware of at the time. Yeah. Let's um, let's grab a call from Brian in Missouri. Hey, Brian, welcome to the program. You have a question? Hey, what's going on, JV? Uh, yeah. First, I just want to thank you for taking my call, extend my love to uh, Carl and Lupe uh, on the horn. But uh, R.L., so you've spoken uh, extensively somewhat about celestial, you know, uh, bodies and happenings. And I'm just curious, you just touched on the terrestrial aspect, where given that the ley lines, like, of the Bermuda Triangle and, like, the dimensional tear, like, what impact do you think that had on, you know, the building of the Coral Castle in southern Florida, where they directly intersect? Like, could this have been built elsewhere, like, in anywhere else in, like, the eastern board? Or do you think that it was specific that he built this and had the means to do so in southern Florida? Well, Brian, that's a great question. And I love the point that you brought up about ley lines. We've been tracking these for years. We we see ley lines, and, and we've been tracking these for centuries, and we say, oh, on this line and on this line, something happens sometimes. And what we're doing, I believe, is tracking the magnetic anomalies that happen along these points at different times. I think if you look at all of the ley lines that have been tracked on the planet, you see all of the possible places that these things can be built. I believe that Ed found the very best spot, and it's the same spot that the Egyptians found when they built the greatest megalithic structures of all time. They built it right above the equator. Uh, near the Tropic of Cancer, right where the moon would have the greatest pull and effect. And if you want to uh, perform something that has to do with celestial alignments, the first one you have to get in line is the moon. And Ed built it so that it was as directly in line with the moon as he possibly could. And it seems like the Egyptians did the exact same thing. Does that help you out, Brian? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate your time, guys. Great, thank All you. All my best. Yeah, thank Thanks, you for that, that question. That was a great question. So let's um, let's tie this together a little bit because we're going to run out of time here, RL. Um, the book, your book, the Leeds Callan Codex, uh, does this offer these theories? Does it offer uh, more insight into the perpetual motion machine? I mean, what what type of information are you presenting in the book? What we have talked about tonight only scratches the surface of what's contained in the book. What I like to do is I like to give a lot more context uh, in the pages of the book. I tell you how I find things, how they go together, why they seem to make sense. Compare them to different things. Let the reader take that in 
and digest it and then make up their own mind about it. I don't want to be the only voice on this, but I would like to give information and then context for that information. And that's very difficult to do in the limited amount of time that we have together, of course. I'm sure you have like 50 more questions that you'd like to ask. And and the book is, is something you can sit and just easily and leisurely take in. And it, it, you can hear the stories behind the discoveries, uh, the context behind them, uh, the ramifications and the implications of those discoveries. And uh, it, it's it's only 77 pages, but every page is absolute dynamite. There's no there's no awkwardness in the book. It's it's just one thing to another. So as you've uncovered these secrets and you've connected them to other megalithic structures like the pyramids, what is the lesson in it for us? For those of us in the 21st century, what are we to take away from this um, and how do we use it? I don't believe that it is overselling it to say that the Coral Castle is the Rosetta Stone to the future of physics. We have to study the Coral Castle. We have to take Ed Leeds Gollum seriously, and we have to be able to disregard anything that is wrong in our own scientific world. We have to be able to take our ego out of it. We have to take our emotion out of it. And we have to simply accept what is real, what is true, and what is provable. And all of those things apply to two words, Ed Leeds Coleman. Let's go back to Ed as a person for a minute. When did he pass away and how did he live out the rest of his life? I remember correctly, Ed died August 9th, 1951. And he died of uh, kidney failure. Uh, in the hospital, he he became very ill, and he put up a sign that said, uh, "I think he said going to the hospital," and and he never came back. And I he spent um, a good portion, I think, of his life uh, from 1945 until 1951 writing uh, and publishing these pamphlets and booklets, and and I think tidying up all of the loose ends that maybe he hadn't gotten to building into the structure itself. And these are companions to one another. You see the structure, you see all of the things that he has carved into it, and those can be decoded. But to give you context, he gives you these booklets and these written words that is that are the companion or the primer to being able to understand what it is you are decoding. Is Coral Castle owned privately at this point? It is. It's owned uh, by the Bars um, and um, the Bar family, and it is uh, ran by Laura May, who I had the pleasure of uh, meeting this weekend when I went down there. Does the Bar family and, does the Bar family understand what uh, what kind of treasure that, that they have there? Well, that was the purpose for my trip this weekend, and that's a great question. I, I went down there and uh, I talked to Laura May, and um, they are aware of my book and the attention that it's getting and the excitement that people have about these discoveries. And they are on the precipice of being able to understand that Ed Leeds Gallman's legacy is far more valuable than we've ever thought. So, whatever happened to that black box? There have been several things that have uh, unfortunately been taken. Uh, since uh, the time of Ed's unfortunate demise. When he passed away and it was clear that he wasn't coming back, Coral Castle had no security. People uh, ransacked uh, Ed's place and took trophies and souvenirs and and things like that. But uh, it does look as though the black box itself was composed of the same size and type of material as the Model T car batteries, only like if you took that same box and just made it longer. Um, it's the same same type of um, construction and build, but it's not the black box. And, and a lot of people are focused on that. The, the black box isn't important. It's knowing what was in there and putting all those pieces together. That understanding the concepts. We, you know, when when you when you have the concepts, you can make the equipment. The equipment. You use junk parts. You know, from a scrapyard, you don't need complicated machinery. You just need to understand the concepts of what he's explaining. And then you can obviously build it out of practically anything. 
but the fact of the matter is, so that black box, it, w- it was taken. It was one of the objects that were that were stolen there. Yes, yes, it was. No one's ever uh, seen that again. And there are many other things just like that that were taken. And, and I consider that really a, not just a crime uh, of, of you know against the Coral Castle and that, but uh, against humanity. We, we've been robbed somewhat. Um, of being able to learn as much as we could, as quickly as we could. But and he, he only had one of those. No, I I saw uh, there are some photographs that he put in in his book where I saw this box on two or three different tripods simultaneously. Okay, so he had numerous then. Okay. Yes, I believe it had to do with how big of a field you wanted to generate. You could possibly link these all together and create a field that would cover the entire Coral Castle so that way he could move from one end to the other okay. or perhaps amplify the effect um, as many times as he wished. So, in other words, connect them in parallel and, and really amplify yes. that. Okay. Yes, exactly. RL, are there more? When, when he moved the 30-ton stone, I think he may have needed to, to crank it up a bit for that one. RL, are there more secrets yet to be uncovered or discovered or decoded? I believe there are. And I am doggedly pursuing the case. And any time that I find something that I know is verifiable and I know is valuable, I'll be bringing it out. Now, you present a lot of this information as well on a YouTube channel of yours, right? Yes, I do. Um, I have a channel called Talking to Lead Skullman. Uh, that is growing more popular by the moment, apparently. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm very happy to say that. I'm very, um, very humbled, very honored by that. But yeah, talking to Leeds Gallman, it's a mouthful. Um, I'm actually uh, thinking about changing the name, but for now I'm going to stick with it. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's really the way that I communicate my ideas and, and discoveries and, and news. And it's kind of it's kind of my Facebook page. I don't I don't do the Twitter face or whatever it is. Twitter face. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter <laughs> Twitter face. Uh, <laughs> it's just YouTubes. Well, now the Barr family that owns the property, have they found any strange types of equipment that, that Ed might have used and that they've, they've gotten storage that you've been able to see? I have been given access to uh, certain parts of the Coral Castle and, and shown some things that I was unaware of. Um, they have a person down at the Coral Castle. His name's Robert. He's a very nice gentleman, and he works there. And he has this uncanny ability to be able to look at almost any tool that Ed had and says, oh, that's a so-and-so from a such-and-such from this year, and what he did was he manipulated to do this so he could perform this task. And that is not my gift, but that is Robert's gift. Um, what I see are uh, the physical evidence, like the, the wedge marks in the coral that he left behind. It looks like smashed clay. It doesn't look like broken rock. You know, these things where the properties have been changed somehow and then changed back. And these are the things that I look for are the the indications of the manipulation of the material themselves. Interesting. I see certain things like solenoids that are like, you know, bottles wrapped with wire and I can say, well, that's a solenoid. And you know, what it reminds me of is an old wall telephone. Where you have a hand crank, you, you drop a dime. He says, you know, 10 cents, you drop a dime. He says, ring the bell twice, you ring the bell twice. That's what you would do with an old wall telephone. And, and then the operator would, would connect your call, and that would be Ed coming around to give you the tour and run you the circuit. You know, so I see things like this, and I wonder, hmm, because when you look at the perpetual motion holder, it looks like the way that the bell works. It's a little U shape with a bar across and uh, the little magneto wheel inside the wall telephone looks just like the generator wheel that he built. And both of them are to scale. Uh, so it does make you wonder uh, exactly what the components are. But I think at this point, the biggest discovery is just that he left the secrets behind. And now I don't know why they, they are being overrun by people who are coming down there to find out uh, what else there is to be discovered. I, I can't do it all. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion, R.L. We appreciate you sharing this information. Where can people get a hold of your book? It's only available on Amazon.com, and it's available in paperback and Kindle. If they buy the paperback, they get the Kindle ebook for free because I want people to have a physical copy in their hand 
should they ever need one. Well, RL, it's been such a pleasure talking to you like usual, and uh, we definitely got to do this again at some point. Thank you so much. I would love to come back anytime you would have me. Oh, you have a great night now. We did want to uh, jump to the phone lines here. This is Fred in North Carolina. I wanted to add to the discussion. Hey, Fred, welcome to the program. Yeah, listen, uh, Patrick Flanagan, years ago, he was he invented the modern hearing aid when he was 11 years old. He, he had 500, he has 500 patents. His science project in, uh, high sc- in the, the fifth grade beat all the high school kids. The Defense Department took it and labeled it top secret, put it in a satellite because it could tell any time the Russians fired an ICBM. Uh, Dr. Kowanda, who won the Nobel Prize on measuring snowflakes up in the Himalayas, see, they're alive. They have circulation going in there until they freeze solid. And he won the Nobel Prize, and he turned his life work over to this kid when he was 14. And, you know, the pyramid, he had... All this has to do with, he moved to Sedona, Arizona, where there's an energy field coming out of the earth. Uh, and and he, he figured out his genius was that a whirlpool, at the very end of the whirlpool, the water molecule approaches the speed of, of light. Oh, wow. It stretches the molecular bond, and it captures energy coming from the center of the Milky Way. He calls this zeta potential. It's been well proven since. All of this is tied together, and amazingly, it's tying into a new uh, simple cancer cure that I just, <laughs> after all this, it has to do with uh, surface tension of water. Hey, Fred can, you, Fred, can you hold on the line for us? We, we have to end the program, but I want to get some information from you once we, uh, once we finish up here. So right. don't go anywhere. All right, everybody, it's Jason and JV. We'll catch you all tomorrow night. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.